Hey, Embrace, uh, welcome to church today. Uh, my name is Travis, if you don't know who I am, but we are excited uh, that you've joined us for worship, whether you're joining us at a campus or online or network churches. Uh, it's always just a privilege to have you. Uh, we are concluding our series called Five Mindsets That Ruin uh, Your Life. We've had kind of a journey here, but today we're at the last week. Uh, each week we have shared just kind of a definition of what a mindset is. So I'm going to share that with you one more time. A mindset, the whole thing that this message is built off of, is the direction of your mind that determines how you interpret and respond to life. Uh, our mind is a neutral. It is in a direction, and the direction that our mind points uh, will change the way we view everything, the way we view our family, the way we view our jobs, our friends. Uh, a mindset is so important. And so we've shared this. Our mindset takes us somewhere, but the real question is, where is your mindset? The direction of your mind, where is it taking you? Because uh, the wrong mindset can ruin your life, but the right one can change everything. Uh, in Scripture, we're told that there's two mindsets, the mindsets of the world and the mindset of Christ. And so this whole series has been how can we uncover the mindset of the world so we can take them off and put on the mindset of Christ. Uh, like I said, we've been kind of a long ways these five weeks. We talked about the mindset of blame, entitlement, black and white thinking. Last week we talked about apathy. And today we're going to talk about everyone's favorite mindset, indulgence. Indulgence. Now indulgence just simply means this. It means excessively satisfying your cravings and desires. Excessively, that's kind of the key word there, excessively satisfying your cravings and desires. Indulgence is when you have a craving or a desire and you just satisfy it over and over and over and over again. Now, I'd like to argue that I think out of all the five mindsets we talked about, uh, the mindset indulgence is probably the one that we struggle with the most uh, because we have never lived in a time in the entire human race where we have more opportunity to indulge than we do today. Uh, we have instant access to everything. Instant access to entertainment, to food, to social media, you name it, we can get it like that. One of the great examples of this is TV. Uh, only a hundred years ago, if you wanted to watch a TV show, You'd have to get in your car or maybe your horse and buggy at that time and go into town and like see it on a screen at a local theater. And if they didn't have a screen, you just have to watch a play. Then in the 1930s, that's when TVs first got introduced into our homes. Uh, but even then, when we had a TV in our home, what do we have? We had like two or three channels. I remember a day when we only had like two or three channels on our TV. Fast forward today, and now we have countless channels television channels, countless streaming, streaming uh, platforms. It is just insane. Uh, you don't even need a TV, right? Because you have a TV in your pocket all the time that you can pull out and indulge in. So that's crazy, but that's not even the half of it. Not only is it easier to indulge than ever before, but now we have companies and businesses that are trying to figure out how we can indulge in their products all the time. There's something called dopamine. You maybe heard of this before. It's a chemical in your brain. Uh, it's the chemical that makes you feel satisfied or, or have pleasure. Uh, companies are figuring out how to trigger in your brain dopamine so they can press that button over and over and over again. Uh, there's a, there's a, a brand of marketing, a strand of marketing called neuromarketing, where they do psychological tests and literally scan brains, human brains, to figure out what will trigger the dopamine, the different colors, the different sounds, the different smells, the different packages. Uh, an example of this, uh, in 2009, a Frito-Lay was trying to figure out how to get women to buy their snacks. I didn't know this, but women snack more than men, but they were not snacking on Frito-Lay, so this was a problem for them. And so they did a bunch of psychological tests, they, uh, they did a bunch of MRI scanning bre uh, women's brains, and they found out everything about women. No, they didn't, right? <laughs> or else they should have told us men, right? But they did find out this. Women don't like bright colors. They prefer muted colors. So they change, especially uh, their, their baked chips, they change the color of it to be more muted. 
And I decided I'm gonna wear muted colors from here on out so my wife views me as a snack, you know? <laughs> See if that works. Got the black thing going today, I guess, but. So that's one thing they did. They also realized that women don't like chaos, and so they hate the chip aisle. The chip aisle is like chaotic to them with all the colors and all the stuff going on, and so they moved the baked chips to the ends of the aisle so they were more easily accessible to women. Last thing, and this is super interesting, the tagline for baked chips used to be no guilt snack. What they found out, though, is women feel more guilty than men. So even having the word guilt on the bag of chips made them less likely to buy it. So they took that off and they just highlighted that it was fat-free and some of the healthier ingredients. This is crazy. Women, the moment you walk into the supermarket, it is designed in a way that you will buy a bag of baked chips from Frito-Lay. The even crazier thing than this is, Every company does this. Amazon knows that you have to see an ad 12 times before you'll buy their product. Instagram knows that their endless scrolling feed makes you spend more time on the app. And not to mention those games we play that are basically slot machines with all the bells and all the, the sounds and all the flashes of color. Whatever it is, companies and businesses, they know exactly what triggers the dopamine, dopamine in your brain, and they are pushing it over and over again. So never in the history of human being has it been easier to indulge, and never in the history of humankind have you been more manipulated to indulge. I don't have to say that. It's not a good thing. So what does God have to say about this mindset of indulgence? Well, we're told in Proverbs, it says, if you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it, and you will vomit. Everybody wants to talk about vomit this morning, I'm sure, but I, I thought this was really interesting. If you indulge, it will make you sick, but not just physically sick, right? Uh, it'll make you your whole life sick. I, I thought about this idea like when we scroll our phones, right? We, if you sit at home and you scroll your phone all night and you ignore your kids, you ignore your wife, you ignore your friends, you ignore your responsibilities, how do you feel after you get done scrolling all night long? Never good. You feel a little sick inside. Also in Proverbs says, do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. I thought that was kind of funny, and I didn't know if that was actually a true when I heard it, but this idea that overindulgence makes you sleepy. It makes you a drowsy. But if you think about it, right, when you indulge in something over and over, what is your greatest hope? Your greatest hope is that it fills you up, that it makes you happy, that it refreshes you, but it does the exact opposite. When you indulge yourself, after indulging, you never feel refreshed. You feel sort of like blah. You feel tired. Lastly, in Philippians, it says, their destiny is destruction because their God is their stomach. Uh, the stomach is symbolic uh, for our cravings and our desires. And what uh, Paul, who wrote this, is saying, he's saying is, if you make things, your cravings, if you make them some of the most important things, they'll become your God. They can become the thing that you worship. Some of you may be there before. You, you've indulged in something so much that it has become something that you worship. And here's some harsh words for when that happens. If something that you're indulging in becomes your God, if it becomes a thing that you worship, it will end up destroying your life. Destruction. God hates indulgence because he hates what indulgence does to us. Here's the deal. One of the main things that the mindset indulgence does is this, though. It ruins good things. This is really important. The things that we indulge in are not often bad. There's nothing wrong with a show. There's nothing wrong with listening to a song. There's nothing wrong with eating food. Like, all this stuff is good stuff. But when we take a good thing and overindulge into it, we make it an all-consuming thing. 
We take a good thing and we make it the most important thing. We take it the good thing and we make it an ultimate thing. And when we do that, we ruin good things. Uh, You know this on a small level. If you eat the same thing every day for 250 days, you will end up hating it. If you listen to the same song over and over, hour after hour, day after day, you'll end up ruining that song. But it goes deeper than that. If you shop and shop and shop and shop, you'll end up ruining shopping and shopping will end up ruining you. If you sleep around, sleep around, sleep around, you'll end up ruining the meaning of sex and it will end up ruining you. When we take a good thing and we make it an all-consuming thing, when we take a good thing and make it the most important thing, when we take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, we end up ruining that good thing. And then that thing can end up ruining you and me. So what do we do? How do we take off this mindset of indulgence and how do we put on the mindset of Christ? Well, I think oftentimes when we think of indulgence, we think of the opposite of indulgence being like denial or abstaining. So if the mindset of the world is indulgence, then the mindset of Christ must be to deny and to abstain, right? We hear that in Christianity. It's like, don't do this, don't do that. You're holy if you stay away from uh, all these things. It's like, deny, deny, deny. But crazy enough, that's not what we really see in the life of Jesus. The mindset of Jesus isn't denial. It's more of a rhythm. This rhythm that I want to call feasting and fasting. Feasting and fasting. Uh, Now, a feast is probably exactly what you think it is. Uh, It's getting together with all your friends to eat and to drink and to laugh, where you tell stories, you play games, uh, and you dance. Uh, Feasting isn't indulgence, but it definitely is enjoyment. You don't go to a feast to deny yourself. You go to a feast to fill yourself up. Now, we still have a lot of great feasts in our, our culture Uh, We have wedding receptions, we have family reunions, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, 4th of July, and the big one coming up next week, Super Bowl, where we're going to totally gorge ourselves, right? So we have all these feasts still in our cultures, but here's the deal. Jesus loved to feast. He loved to feast so much that people actually criticized him of being an overindulger. Take a look at this. This is Jesus talking. He said, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, He has a demon. Then I came eating and drinking. And you say, Here's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of the tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus, he feasted so much that the religious Pharisee type people, they called him a drunkard. They called him a glutton. Jesus loved to feast. Listen to a couple of the feasts that Jesus was a part of. Uh, Then Matthew held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So Jesus, he meets this guy named Matthew, who's a tax collector. He invites him to a feast at his house with a whole bunch of other shady characters, and Jesus is like, okay, sign me up. He shows up at the feast. Another time, Uh, This is when Jesus is attending a wedding reception, and this one's going to blow your mind a little bit. Uh, But Jesus is at this wedding reception, and the family comes to him and says, Hey, Jesus, we've ran out of wine at this wedding reception. What do we do? And Jesus, he scolds them for even having wine at a reception. No, that didn't happen. He took six jars of water, and he turned them into six jars of wine. And then they took the wine out to the guests. And listen what they say. Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. I don't know what that means, too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. You've saved the best. Till now, Jesus didn't just feast. Jesus didn't just enjoy the feast. Jesus made the feast better. Jesus loved to feast. 
Now, a really important note on this. This is really important. Jesus was a feaster. He was not a sinner. Jesus wasn't indulging in things that he was not supposed to indulge in. There is a way that we are supposed to use God's gifts, and Jesus used them in that way. And no way do I want you to hear me saying is like, hey, it's okay to have a little sex before I'm married. It's okay to get a little trash on Friday nights. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus was a feaster. He was not a sinner. Also, some of you know that there are good things that you just cannot enjoy. The Bible never says that alcohol is evil, but some of us, we know that we cannot touch the stuff. Please, nothing that Jesus is saying, nothing that I am saying is saying, oh, it's okay to have a little. No. You know if you have some, it turns into overindulgence every time, so you just can't. Your family's more important. Your job, your purpose in life is more important than that. So Jesus was a feaster, but he was not a sinner. He did not overindulge. So Jesus feasted. So that means that we can feast But Jesus did something else that we are not going to be so excited about. Jesus feasted, but he also fasted. If feasting is enjoying, fasting is denying. Now, I know, like, how old school I sound talking about fasting because nothing in our culture says that we should fast. Everything in our culture says indulge, indulge, indulge. Have some more, have some more. Talking about fasting is like talking about 8-track tapes, right? And if you don't know what an 8-track tape is, that's my point exactly, right? But fasting is so important. Fasting can unlock something for us when it comes to the indulgent mindset. That's kind of crazy. In the Bible, it doesn't talk a lot about Jesus fasting. But the reason why it doesn't talk a lot about it is it was so common in the culture. Fasting is so uncommon to us, but to an early century Jew like that, it would have been totally common. Something that they did every single week, multiple times a month. Listen to something Jesus, this is him teaching. Jesus says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Those first three words, And when you fast, when you fast, when you fast, Jesus is assuming that they are already doing this. It isn't, hey, if you decide to fast, this is if you fast sometime, he's like, no, this is something you're doing every single week. Let me give you some guidelines on how to fast. It was just assumed that this was a part of their culture. Uh, We do here in one spot in Matthew about a time that Jesus did fast. It says that uh, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards was hungry. That's the best. Like, afterwards was hungry. We got that part. But God leads Jesus into the wilderness to fast. He doesn't do this because he wants to ruin his life. He doesn't do this because he wants to take away his joy. He doesn't do this because he wants to just take away these gifts from Jesus. No, he leads Jesus into the wilderness because he knows that there's something important about fasting, that there's something about fasting that can unlock something for us, that in fasting we learn how to feast. And in fasting, we start to put in order what is the most important. So what does this all mean? If the mindset of the world is indulgent, then the mindset of Christ is a rhythm of feasting and fasting. Say it one more time. If the mindset of the world is indulgent, the mindset of Christ is a rhythm of feasting and fasting. This is so hard for us because we are such black and white thinkers. We had a message about that, week two of this series. Like we want to say it's fasting or feasting. It's enjoying or denying. But as we look at Jesus' life, we ain't going to get that. There's a rhythm of both. Uh, One of my favorite restaurants to go to in the entire world is the Carnival Brazilian Grill. Uh, It's one of these Brazilian steakhouses where they come out with 
shrimp and chicken and steak and steak and steak and steak and steak. And then when you can't eat anymore, they bring out the pineapple. God bless you for the pineapple. Like, it's unbelievable. Uh, but do you know what I do every time I go, and I don't go very often, but when I do go to the Brazilian steakhouse, do you know what I do leading up to that? I fast. I don't eat morning. I don't eat lunch. I don't eat snacks. And I get there, and I'm ready to eat. I'm ready to eat this food and just enjoy this deliciousness. What do you think would be the worst thing I could possibly do going to the Carnival Brazilian Grill? What is the worst thing I could do? Here's what, here's what I, I would say. 30 minutes before, if I ate 15 pancakes with butter and syrup, because nothing fills you up like a pancake, right? If I ate 15 pancakes before I went into there, all that delicious food would look disgusting. I would have no appetite for it whatsoever. Because in order to enjoy, I have to deny. In order to feast, I have to learn to fast. See what's happening here? This is the rhythm that we need for our lives. In order to enjoy the feast, we have to learn to fast. In order to enjoy the feast, we have to learn to fast. This is so backwards, but so many things about God is so backwards. We actually enjoy more when we fast. Our enjoyment doesn't go down, it actually goes up. You remember when your grandpa said you can have too much of a good thing? He was right. But fasting has a way of regulating that. It has a way from, of keeping us from indulgence. But even more than that, even though more than keeping us away from indulgence, it has a way of removing the good things in our life so that we can go up and we can see the truly good thing. That's God himself. This is what you see when Jesus went to fast in the wilderness. God took the good things away from him, so Jesus was only left with God. It helped him to see what is the most important. In order to enjoy the feast, we have to learn to fast. So, if you want to take off this mindset of indulgence and put on the mindset of this rhythm of feasting and fasting, how do you start? Like I said at the beginning of the message, we as a culture, we struggle much more with feasting than we do fasting. Uh, but I know there is a small percentage of you here today that struggle with feasting. You're just like, deny, 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 deny. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. And my challenge for you today is this. Lighten up a little. Learn to feast. A little. Uh, I grew up Mennonite, and so my, the church I grew up was a great church. It reminded me just more of a traditional uh, church. But one thing that Mennonites frowned upon was dancing. We weren't supposed to dance. I remember a pastor giving a message on this once, and he talked about he was at his, his, his daughter's wedding, and they went to the reception after the wedding, and he went on the dance floor, and he danced the night of away. And the next day, some people from his congregation approached him and said, ah, that was shameful for what you did last night. That was embarrassing that you were a pastor out there dancing like that. And I remember the past, I'll never forget what he said. He said, I looked them in the eye and I said, when your daughter gets married, you dance. It would be wrong to not dance. Some of us, were so about deny, 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 and we just need to lighten up a little bit, splurge a little bit, throw a party, go to a movie, take a vacation, get your nails done. Never done it. I heard it's great, though. Build a snowman with your kids. Go out to eat with your spouse. Laugh. Lighten up a little bit and feast. Enjoy the feast. So that's... To a small percentage of you, you know who you are. To the rest of us, and I'm in this boat, we have no trouble feasting, but we need to learn how to fast. I got a pretty bold challenge for you this morning. Some people are going to be handing out 
um, some cards here. Uh, but coming up on February 14th, that's not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, is a season in the church called Lent. You maybe heard of it before. Uh, but historically, that's the 40 days leading up to Easter. And Christians throughout history, they fasted for the 40 days leading up to Easter. I think that's so cool that, that the church has always had this sort of rhythm in it. Feasting, fasting, feasting, fasting. Uh, you know when Lent is around the corner because all the places start selling fish sandwiches, right? Because the Catholics can't eat meat on Fridays. Uh, so I'm just going to say it. I think fish is a meat still. I don't, I don't understand it, but we'll just go with it. I, I want to invite you to do something very countercultural uh, this Lent. I want you to fast for 40 days. Right there. Fast for 40 days. Now, it's important to remember, fasting does not decrease your joy. It increases your joy. And when you fast, when you get rid of the good things in your life, you are left with the best thing, God himself. Fasting is a spiritual practice that points us up to God. Now, I want to be super broad this morning. You can fast from anything. This is just my one challenge. Fast from something that you might be typically tempted to indulge in. Fast from something that you might be typically tempted to indulge in. Maybe it's Instagram, Starbucks, alcohol, Amazon purchases, fishing. Sorry, husbands, the wives had me put that one in there. I want to be serious with you this morning. What I am planning on fasting, on is, fasting from is uh, right after the Super Bowl, I'm fasting from football until September. I'm just... I'm going to go for it. I'm going for it. Pray for me. But here's the deal. Just pick something that you're tempted to indulge in and fast for it for 40 days. Because this is what we want to experience. We want to work this muscle of denying. This muscle that says, I can say no. This muscle that says, God's goodness is better than his good gifts. I mean, we love his gifts, we enjoy his gifts, but we want God more. That is the muscle that we're start trying to work. So I'm just going to give us 30 seconds right now. If you've got a pen, pull it out. Write it on your phone or whatever. But I want you to write down, what is one thing that you are typically tempted to indulge in that you can try to fast for for the next 40 days? Not to decrease your joy, but to increase it. Not because God is punishing you, but because you want to be closer to him. So let's just take 30 seconds and think about that. Uh, if the mindset of the world is indulgence, the mindset of Christ is this rhythm of feasting and fasting. If we want to enjoy the feast, we have to learn to fast. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much uh, for your example in Scripture. We thank you that you taught us this rhythm. You didn't just say deny, deny, deny. Uh, you said Deny so that you can have what's better, but also enjoy the good things that I've given you. Lord, we love you. And I just pray that you would help us to figure out what that thing is for the next 40 days and to stick to it. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hey everyone, it's Adam from Embrace. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to subscribe to Embrace's YouTube channel to stay updated. You can also click here to check out other videos. Thanks for watching.